Good morning all, welcome to this BUTS seminar. BUTS stands for Building Up Digital Strategists, and we're talking about digital strategies in form and in content in form, because we're talking about digital strategies in teaching, but also in content, and you, you, you'll notice uh, we're talking about digital strategies as subject of, of management council. Let me first welcome our BUDS partners, our external experts who will be presenting this seminar, and in particular, uh, you as, as our participant. Uh, in carefree and uh, times, we started BUDS as a development project in which we wanted to enrich a particularly interesting initiative with a blended component. Reality has had an impact on our plans, but in addition to many negative consequences, we had to reinvent a bit ourselves in the last year and a half. The fact that we can now organize this uh, seminar uh, in this way is also one of the positive consequences. In this seminar, we have five speakers, of which three are external experts. Let me tell you something more about that. We did not look for these external experts specifically for this seminar. The experts, Professor Pisoni, Professor Bustos, and Professor Kaltz, have been guiding our project since the beginning of this year and have already advised us and given feedback at different times in the process. So it was obvious that they would be in our agenda today as well. Soon they will give a presentation about their expertise from which they gave us advice on our project. They will not immediately go into buts, the project itself, or at least not at the first approach. Of course, we would like very much to present the BUDS project itself. This will be done by Professor Corrado Ceruti, who will also chairs the project, the BUDS project. Uh, first speaker is Professor Close, who is also affiliated with one of our BUDS partner universities, and he will look at a digital teaching form from a broader point of view. So we start with a broader view on uh, digital teaching, then specifically discuss the BUDS project itself, and then look back at the three presentations a bit wider than but with a case, uh, but also with a systematic contribution about an aspect of blended learning. Let's go into the reason why we choose to introduce blended learning in our teaching. I think that there will always be an element of student centeredness in it. This can be in the form of education namely in that we can let students carry out parts of the learning online so that we reach more students. It may be that we can serve more diverse students by differentiating more. And we may be able to intensify student learning by giving students more feedback that we don't have the manpower to do. It may also be the intention to make better use of time we spend with students' life by being able to spend more on complex skills that may not be easily digitally or online. In the introduction, is the introduction of blended learning always a win? I think that it is almost always the case, if only because it automatically obliges us to think carefully about the concept of education, what we do and why. That redesign aspect is almost always a win, even if ultimately we decide to blend less than we initially thought. That element of consideration, why should we do that? Where is the profit? And in what area do we want to make a profit? Posing these kinds of questions as part of considering blended learning is always a win. We will also hear such considerations during the course of this seminar. But first, some parts of uh, some words about our partners. Uh, you see the logos on the screen at this moment. Our, of course, our first and prime partner is uh, the Erasmus Plus program. Um, what would we do without them? Um, University of Torvegata is leading the project. Professor Charuti will talk about this later. And uh, University of Carlos Certera in Madrid uh, is a partner with a lot of experience in teaching technology. Professor Klaus will demonstrate. University of Nova de, Lisbo Nova de Lisboa, University of Eastern Finland, University of Antwerp and Antwerp Management Schools are heavily involved in the project. Uh, not only in development content, but as part, uh, as uh, the test uh, element. The BUDS project originated within the European network, the Young European Research Universities, 
and we thank them for their support and their backgrounds. And for the summer schools itself, we highly uh, rely on uh, input from consultancy, consultancy firms with the help of ESSA Consult, which is the association representing the most important management consultancy firms in Italy and, and Europe. And for this uh, webinar, specifically technical support comes from DeepSheet, but they will also support us later in the project more on content uh, issues. Thank you for that. Before I give the floor to our speakers, some organizational issues. At the end of the session, we provide 20 minutes of questions and answers, um, and there is room for reflection. We do not provide time for questions between the sessions, so please write down your questions, reflections uh, about the, the session. You may also ask questions in the chat to keep it clear. We have technically closed the, que the, the que questions and answers uh, feature uh, in Zoom, and that is to avoid having to follow in two places. So you can ask a question in the chat. We will not answer them during the sessions to keep the attention to the speakers, on the speakers. So at the end, we will answer some of your questions. I hope you have a lot of reflections and, uh, and questions so that we can select the questions we can answer. You can write your answers, your questions directly after each session or just remember them and put them in the chat during the session or uh, at the end. Only the camera of the speakers is on, so you can't on, and you can't on uh, yourself. In the meantime, I saw that some other participants have joined us, so you're very, very welcome. So uh, now let me give the floor to Professor Klaus. Professor Klaus, you can, if you want, already upload your uh, presentation. Professor Klaus uh, is the vice director of University Carlos Terra from, from Madrid. And he is the driving force after several innovation projects and initiatives uh, in teaching at his universities. And he has been with us uh, in this project, in the BUDS project from, from the very beginning. So please, Professor Klaus, floor is yours. Thank you, Professor van der Poel. Thank you, Luke. Thank you. Hello to all the colleagues of the BUDS projects, uh, to all the speakers of the seminar and all the participants. It's a pleasure to talk to you with some ideas, some reflections about digital teaching. My presentation will have three parts. I will talk about cloud education. I will talk about liquid education. And I will talk about active education. Maybe this is more known. But I will start with an anecdote, with a real story that happened. We were showing the adapted uh, lecture halls to some deans and, and members of the um, leadership of, of the faculties, where we, in, on top of the blackboards and, and the projectors for PowerPoint slides, we added some additional tools. We put uh, interactive uh, um, monitor to write with the digital board, we put cameras, we put additional um, speakers. And one of these uh, professors told me, she was a, a math uh, professor, she told me, a digital board is not good for us. It's not good for all math and all physics professors because we need a lot of space. I need to write in one uh, uh, corner a formula and then continue and then refer to this formula. And I cannot do this on the digital board because the space is too small. Of course, the chart board, the digital, the, the, the blackboard has a lot of advantages. There's a lot of space. It's easy to use. You don't need any electricity. You can use your own handwriting. And this is true. And she was referring to that, this lot of space. And she could not adapt to the interactive monitor. But it's also true that the digital board has some other advantages. OK, it's limited space, but it might have a lot of software pages or a limited canvas, depending on the application you're using. And it's storable, it's recordable, it's shareable. I will refer to three advantages now. One is the possibility of smart writing, the intelligence behind the software that can help you that the chalkboard cannot compete with. The multimedia that you can include on top of your writing on, on your input. And it's connected. Therefore, it's collaborative. <clears throat> and therefore, it's a much better playground to collaborate with others, other students or students between themselves. Let, let me go through these three advantages. One is this automatic recognition of handwritten text. No, you write something and maybe, okay, you didn't understand it. Okay, I press the button 
and the software does it for you. The, the Blackboard cannot compete with that. Or also write shapes perfectly. So on top of the writing, the handwriting of, of words that can be improved, you can draw some figures and then they become perfect. Or, or you can even draw some pictures and then automatically you get the artificial intelligence to, okay, this is a cow, is, is a, maybe uh, um, offer you some possibilities. Okay, no, I want this dog and, and then I use this. Or I can uh, draw a boat also very easily and make it perfect. Okay, this auto drawing is something is the intelligence you have behind the digital board that you cannot have behind the classical chalk board. Secondly, you can include not only images that are selected from a, a, a menu, you can also include rich multimedia. For instance, this, was, this lady was a math teacher. Maybe she want to explain the line integral and maybe she draws very nicely uh, to explain the, the students, what do you mean by the line integral? But why not including a multimedia video or an animation or a simulation that helps you and express this easier within when, when uh, you're writing as well. Okay, I mean this, okay, and then I, I draw it around and then I extend the line. Okay, this is what I mean with, with the uh, line integral. So explanation gets much uh, better because you have a better uh, playground to explain things. By the way, I don't know whether you know three blue, one brown. They are very interesting videos, you know? For instance, one in which uh, it's explained that you can draw with some approximation any image just with adding up rotating vectors. What do I mean by that? Okay, for instance, here, this uh, musical symbol can be drawn by an addition of rotating windows. In a second, I explain to you the principles behind the Fourier transform. I don't know whether they're mathematicians, engineers, uh, in the audience probably, okay, in one single uh, image uh, video, I explained something very really profound. And thirdly, it's connected. It, you can collaborate, you can invite others to join this playground. You can have a shared board, for instance, like this, the jam board, where you can draw and invite others to participate in drawing or in brainstorming with you or in doing many other things. And there are many boards around. This is the Google Jam board, but then there's a Microsoft whiteboard, there's Miro, which I like very much. Also very, lot of uh, templates to do different things, frames, etc. cetera, uh, or mural, and, and you know them, Padlet, which is more a post-it, etc. So there are hundreds of different tools for helping you collaborate in the cloud. So, well, the Blackboard really pales uh, behind all, all the possibilities that um, uh, are offered with the shared board where the cloud is an additional meeting space. It doesn't matter if the students are in the room or are, are online. In any case, you uh, have this additional playground, this additional meeting space. This is an image on the left. Uh, of our master's uh, courses, master classrooms, uh, where we had students here in, 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 in the classroom and also remote students. And they were all seeing the same image, the same uh, digital board, either projected or maybe they had their own uh, computer or um, smartphone to see it more closely and maybe for interaction or even for engagement, all these engagement apps uh, like Kahoot, Socrative, Mediment, et cetera, they can be used with students in the room and uh, remotely in the same way. And there are many engagement apps like Kahoot, Mediment, Quizalyze, Quizzes, Wiklab, uh, Socrative, all that you want. Okay, so really the professor who said, okay, I want the chalkboard after this explanation, it's really, uh, 
a disruptive change which the digital board offers. What do you have to do as a professor? You have to unlearn to use the chalkboard and learn how to use the digital board. Not, not just learn how to use it, but forget your old customs, forget that, okay, maybe you lose some advantages, but you gain many others. Okay, 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 the professor would say, I understand now, I must adapt to the digital medium, which is different, distinctive from the physical one. Okay, this could be the first lesson, but no, 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 you didn't get it. It's not that there are two things, the digital and the physical. It's not a dichotomy. It is not just physical or digital. It's not just either the university is a traditional one, classrooms, everything face to face, or like the open universities, distance universities where everything is online. No, 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 no. It's much more subtle than that. It's even more subtle than what can be understood by hybrid or blended, where okay, you have some activities which are online, some are, are face to face, and there are many, probably many definitions and not clear definitions of what blended and hybrid means. You know? I, I think there's a problem, in fact, of terminology. You know? what, what do you really, and does everybody understand the same under blended or hybrid or mixed mode or bimodal? What is the difference? What, what, what is what that you divide in online and offline or on-site? The thing is much more subtle and much more difficult to grasp. I talk about liquid education, where you mix the red, which is the online, and the blue, which is the on-site, in subtle, innovative ways, much more smaller grain ways. I like very much Phil Libin. Phil Libin was born in, in Leningrad, so St. Petersburg now. And when he was eight years old, old he, he went to the States and he has uh, started many companies. One of them is MMHMM. -hmm. He says he calls the company like this because you can talk about it when you are eating. Mm -hmm. And I, I recommend it very much. I will talk about it later also. But I like very much what he says. He talks about remixing reality. He talks about the DJification of the world or IL plus better than in real life. I would like to take this up and talk about the DJification of education. Like the DJ who takes recorded music and put its own innovation and creativity to make an experience, combining music, going back and forth, cutting, doing the same thing. And they're famous DJs. You could say, okay, DJs is, is, is what, what is the essence of being a DJ? You have to be creative as well. What do you put when? Do you go back? Do you go first? Do you make this experience? I think we educators can be also like educational DJs. And I give an example. I don't know whether you know, uh, and there are many apps, but I will mention one which is called Ed Puzzle. Ed Puzzle announces itself as make any video your lesson. I recently, a few weeks ago, taught the lesson. It was online, but it could have been also in classroom where I took a video. You can take a video from YouTube, from Khan Academy, from Natural Geographic. And there are many good videos around. And you insert into the video in different moments, some reflection points. Some moments where the student has to answer something or solve, a, respond to a quiz, a multiple choice quiz, etc. So you see here uh, at the bottom, the different points, moments where I inserted to this video from YouTube, some questions, some open-ended questions or some quizzes, etc. Okay, I'm making this video my own and I put my own creativity and, uh, and make it into a, really an educational, element, not just see, li listening to a video, but having this uh, interaction and reflection about this video at particular points. And there are very many interesting uh, sites like Common Sense, which I recommend also very much on how to teach with videos. No? There are several steps. Uh, first, you show the video, and then there's a back channel tool where students can uh, make comments then you can ask for arguments versus answers and so have reflection. Maybe you, at the end, you assign a project to do something with the video with some of these tools 
like Ed Puzzle or Media Breaker. So there's an on-site part that the student and the professor are in the same room or not. And there's some recorded online things which are inserted into it. And there's an interesting uh, collaboration into this part. Okay. It can be on-site on the left-hand side, but it can be also online live synchronously. And we use recorded uh, asynchronous content to it. And you use maybe YouTube videos, maybe the back channel or, or whatever uh, chat function. And you, then you annotate or remix videos in educational ways. Or like I did also is in some class, I, I, I produced a MOOC you know, several years ago. It has more than 500,000 students right now uh, about Java. And there are some interesting videos. And I sometimes use in class these videos themselves. You not know, when I explain sorting, I use my video, I'm your, my own assistant, because in these videos, there can be superimposition, there can be additional uh, <coughs> elements you include that you don't have so much in class. And you can stop and you ask questions and you use this video to help yourself. Very recently, there was this paper uh, in EduCourse uh, talking about bichronos, a new word, bichronos, blending asynchronous and synchronous online learning be it online or on site. Okay, in other words, to the list of many different words that may be confusers, but what I want to express here is this rich combination of uh, online and on site, synchronous and asynchronous that can give to many interesting combinations. This is something the young people know very well. I don't know whether any of you uses TikTok. I didn't use it. I had, I had to install it to see very well. But there's this thing where you can record a video, including another recorded video from someone else. And in this way, you can teach to dance, but somebody dances first and then makes a stop. It's now your turn. And you can use this video and now dance and, and make a video of the two parts and then dance together or sing or these popcorn duets where every word. So these are two videos recorded at different moments combined to make something new. Of course, now the extreme is this duet chains. I have here a YouTube a video, which I will not show, but you will get it in the slides where you make a chain of combinations to, very, to do many interesting things. So you combine the recorded and record something new which somebody else can uh, add to and et cetera, et cetera. This is remixing reality or what is sometimes called simulife. How do you know that I'm speaking live to you now? Maybe it was recorded before. I participated in some events where it was shown as live, but I recorded my presentation before. And maybe it was at the end uh, ready for taking questions than in real life. So everything is very uh, interesting how the reality can be remixed. Okay, let me finish the second part by saying it's not just physical or digital. It's a rich combination of synchronous and asynchronous, uh, uh, online and on-site, where you have to unlearn the separation of concerns. It's not just two separate, it's not a dichotomy, but you have to mix learn to mix and remix concepts in many ways. Okay, 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 a professor could say, okay, I, I, I understand it, I got it. Uh, I must learn to remix online and on-site synchronous and asynchronous in an innovative way to give my lectures. No, 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 you didn't understand. You understood part of the, it's not to give your lectures. It's not your lectures that you have to give. It's not old way, no, it, you have to, change the way of doing it. And probably many people are doing this already, but I, I want to stress it because I think it's important. You have to move from lecturing to active learning. And this is well known and I think probably will not tell you anything new here, but I think it's a very important thing to pay attention to. Because now in the past year, we achieved uh, successfully teaching continuity during long lockdown, didn't we? On the teacher side, the teacher was teaching on his laptop or her laptop, and the student was attentive and uh, listening to the professor and taking notes, etc. 
maybe it was not so good. Maybe there was a lot of distractions on the mobile phone or a visit to the refrigerator to get something. Maybe they were not all paying attention all the time, even if they were present uh, with the name on the list. Or maybe it's even worse. Maybe they were absent at all. Some professors told me, Wait, I have more, more students than normal in class. Well, this is nominally. Because in, you should not lecture, you should move to active learning. And, and this is well known. There, there are many techniques, many um, um, strategies and, and, and ways to achieve it, which I will not. But what I want to stress, well, these two things match well, this cloud education and this active education, because now you can meet even online on the cloud. But I want to stress is this in the latest months, there has been an enormous investment also in education technology. And what we have been using right now, what we're using here, Zoom, are in reality uh, systems for video conferences, not for video classes. Even if the, a, lot, a lot of new features are coming out every day. Let me just mention a few. I will concentrate more on, on one of these. Um, tools that really support not just the lecturing, not just a video conference like we're doing right now, one-way uh, communication, because a class should not be a one-way communication, it should be an active playground. A video support for a class is not the same as for a video conference. And other elements should support a class that do not exist at video conference systems. I will mention three systems, I will um, delve more into Engagely, but there are some others which I will mention, you know, to see what additional features now at education technology, video conferencing or video educational systems um, can solve. No? What idea, Engagely, uh, extends or, or improves the idea of the breakout groups, where you divide uh, a whole class into groups, but you have to click a lot here, there, you put them together and, and, and then you go back to, to the class. No, 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 no. This is the idea of the of tables where you have the students divided into two to 10 students around a table where the students can talk to one another. Did you understand what the professor said without interrupting everybody else? So you have this familiarity with the friends you normally talk to like in, in the normal lecture hall, but put online. And then you can have, this is the group where I am, my table, I'm listening to the professor, and this is the list, the, the, the mosaic of all the participants. At some particular point, you can uh, raise your hand and then everybody can hear you. And in this way, you can apply many interesting active learning techniques. So this idea of dividing the students and have this familiarity as, at the same time as being together with others in the classroom is a very interesting concept. And you can listen to the presentation and even take notes and then uh, store them for later on. They, they can have shared doc each by table so they can work on different things. You can apply uh, well, let me see. Let, let me go here. Even collaboration patterns like jigsaw, peer instruction, pyramid that really improve this or, or, or forget about this just one way communication. So make them work, make them be active, participating, uh, and, uh, and, and do some other more pedagogically interesting ways. Then there are many other things which I will not go into detail, but also support for a hybrid class so that the students in class with their smartphones can follow and talk and be participating online in the uh, whole experience. Okay, there are many more things that can be said, but I want, I want to continue. There are many other uh, tools like class. It's interesting that Zoom has opened up their platform as an API so that other companies could build on top of it. And class is one of that. Class for Zoom uses Zoom, but puts on top of it many education related features that are useful for teaching a class. Another one is class in, which is Chinese, 
version, and then many other, and probably there will come up many more uh, uh, additional tools for this. This is mm -hmm, which I mentioned before, where you can mix the background with your face and with uh, your slides uh, to do interesting applications. Let me finish this uh, talk about tools. Um, also, by mentioning a few others, Wonder, Gatherly, Gather Town, Remo, Circle, etc. Wonder I've been using um, in my classes the last semester, where you can have video conferences which are spontaneously uh, active when your uh, image or when your uh, dot, which represents you, gets closer to others, and then uh, a video conference comes up. So it's not just planned video conferences. Video conferences, you talk to one, you talk to another, you move here, you move there. And, and this is much more uh, spontaneous and interesting. So let me uh, finish this third part. It's from lecturing to active learning and not just active learning in the classroom, but active learning online. And the uh, developer systems are now including more and more features to support this active learning on over the web. So you have to unlearn now the old way of instruction and learn how to facilitate learning because the important thing is not teaching, the important thing is that the learner learns. So we've seen three challenges, which I've summarized as cloud education, liquid education, and active education. The first one refers to using the tool, the chalkboards, which have to unlearn and learn how to use the digital board and all the features that come with it. The second one is we're really not separating uh, physical and digital, but remixing in many interesting ways. And, and I think in the coming months, more interesting ways will come up. And the third one is that tools now are more and more facilitating active education, active learning, and not just one way communication between the professor and the students. Because as John Maynard Keynes said, the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, not only, I would say, of course, also in the new ideas that you have to learn as an instructor and as a student, but in escaping the old ones, which ramify for those brought up as most of us have been into every corner in, on our minds. We try to, when we, see something new we try to include it in, uh, into our mental framework to a mental structure and sometimes this mental structure does not help us in understanding the rich possibilities that lie with these new features with this i want to finish my presentation and thank you all very much for listening thank you very much thank you very much carlos carlos as always you uh, you uh, succeed in uh, in offering me uh, a few new tools um, uh, I didn't know about uh, and 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 on the other hand uh, reminding us that it's not only about tools it's about uh, uh, how to uh, change from from uh, from lecturing to at, in the end the ultimately is is well it's, it's facilitating learning the learning students uh, stimulating students to, to be active in the learning. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It, it, it will be a challenge, I think, for, for, for all our, our staff and, and universities, education, all levels of education, so in higher education, where uh, uh, all staff has, has, was uh, forced to learn new things, things that would probably never thought that they, they would learn and they would not have the intention to do it. And it will be a challenge to uh, get them, get them, keep them, keep them on board. Uh, decide which which competences they learned that they will uh, keep on keep on uh, applying and 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 going and make a bit further and uh, the the suggestions you, you made also on tools but also a bit bit the, the, the background of uh, not falling into the pitfalls of of, of just using the techniques uh, that that will be very important and it's a it's a very good background for for our presentation for our webinar thank you very much uh, thank you Again, I remind the participants to, uh, if you have reflections, if you have questions for Carlos, write them down uh, on a paper, maybe uh, uh, you can put them in the chat already or keep them, keep them later and then we will uh, select uh, 
our uh, questions and see which we can go into uh, later uh, during the, the, the session at the, at the end. Okay, now we would like to go to Corrado. Carola, hi, good morning. We have talked uh, this morning, uh, so it's the first time we see each other again. Uh, Professor Car Corrado Geruti is Professor of Management at the University of Rome, Torfregata. He's a uh, uh, director of the Master of Science program in Business Administration and director of a research center of procurement. If you want, uh, Corrado, you can upload your presentation uh, already during my introduction. Um, innovation and digital technologies, specifically in management consulting, is his prime interest in teaching and research, and Colorado chairs the Pudge project. We are very thankful for that, Colorado. And he also chairs other European projects. Please, Colorado, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Luke. And uh, thank you very much to all our participants. And uh, thanks a lot, Carlos, for this uh, fantastic introduction into, um, into our journey. I would like to um, present you uh, the experience we have uh, achieved in our BUDS project in, uh, in, in moving forward with, uh, blended, uh, uh, with blended learning. Okay, let me, um, we will, uh, I will start describing you the original goal of the projects and uh, our original approach to it. And then we will see how responding to uh, uh, COVID-19 emergency, but also um, looking at uh, deeper into the new possibility of uh, digital learning, we have uh, reshaped and we are reshaping our projects. Uh, in fact, as Carlos mentioned, um, when we originally uh, developed and proposed this project, it was uh, in a moment when uh, blended learning was uh, rather uh, a niche uh, issue. So we were uh, back in 2018 and uh, uh, most of us were doing um, only or almost only uh, teaching in presence. The project was uh, related to digital and uh, both digital contents and digital tools. In particular, as from the name Digital Strategists, um, the goal of the project uh, is to uh, build up uh, digital management consultants, knowing that uh, in digital transformation, companies are looking for management consulting support and knowing that management consulting company have uh, reshaped their uh, service line, their service offer to a significant extent in order to uh, cope with the new um, request from the market. And we wanted to do it so, so to have a contents related to digital using digital tools and exploring innovative way of uh, building up uh, digital, uh, digital skills, not only the more quantitative one, the one related to codified knowledge, but also a lot of practice based through interacting a lot with consultants. And of course, our goal is to contribute with a little drop to the big request of digital skills and strengthen the employability of our participants. The original idea was to do a blended program. As Carlos was saying, using red and blue. But uh, in order to uh, well, build up uh, successful digital management consultants. And we have these two um, ingredients, the codified knowledge and the practice-based skills. Eh? Codified knowledge, management approaches, data science tools, 
and practice-based skills, analytical and soft skills from um, uh, digital um, management consulting companies. We were uh, using for the first one, an e-learning platform. And for the second one, as we will see, lectures, interactions, project activities. But they were basically two ingredients that were present at the time individually. So in a certain period, part of the program, it was only e-learning. And in one week, very intensive presence. So two separate ingredients put together, but not shaken up uh, really uh, a lot. Let me go through these two uh, sections. So we, um, we, we designed and we are uh, building up uh, online modules where uh, students can go and get the basic knowledge related to digital transformation. We did it, uh, we thought at the very beginning as a good way of setting a common ground for all the students. I forgot to mention that in our uh, program, we are hosting basically two types of students. Students with a management background that needs to grow in terms of digital tools um, and students with a data science background. We should learn more about the context, the processes, the business processes in which they, the tools, the algorithms they are studying will be applied. So we thought the online modules as something coming before the face-to-face uh, -face interaction to level the background and uh, to uh, give management students a bit more knowledge about data science and vice versa. Data scientists, data science students, a bit more knowledge about management tools. And then the idea was after this online introductory part to have face-to-face -face training, very highly involvement a week, uh, an intensive week that was starting on uh, Sunday, on Sunday afternoon with a warm-up session till, um, till Saturday morning with a final wrap-up session and then staying residential. As a matter of fact, in a very um, nice environment, a, a Renaissance villa, once residence of a Pope uh, in, the, in the Renaissance, uh, up on the Isle of Rome, staying together from, well, from Sunday afternoon to uh, Saturday morning, working from early in the morning to late in the evening, doing a lot of uh, exercises together and uh, sharing really everything eh? from the breakfast till uh, the work uh, after um, after dinner. So two very clear uh, parts, and even in our original project path, we add. Um, an initial, um, these two components, uh, the e-learning contents and the face-to-face -face element. In our project proposal, we, um, we designed uh, three different learning cycles. One more focused on theory, then going more into tools, then bringing elements related to practice. But in fact, now we realize that in our proposal, we did it, uh, this, this growing path, only with respect to the e-learning contents. So 
uh, as we stated in our proposal, the initial introductory, introductory e-learning path, um, e-learning modules could have become richer and richer every year. And this was the basic growing element while we would keep um, the face-to-face -face interaction rather stable and as a support, as a test and a support of what we were doing, um, uh, what we were doing uh, online. So one part was innovative and growing while the interactive program, uh, the face-to-face -face one were staying rather uh, stable. Then um, COVID uh, entered and we were forced either not to do it or to move it uh, fully digital. And, uh, and we decided to, to uh, move fully digital. So what was original? Online um, asynchronous uh, e-learning plus highly interactive in-presence face-to-face learning became remote, fully remote. So we had uh, our module, our modules in, in e-learning as well as synchronous lectures and synchronous group work. And um, le le this we, we did at the very beginning, a, a change that we um, extended the period of the synchronous training from one week to two weeks, as we thought that it was impossible to have people uh, eight hours uh, on the screen or eight plus hours on the screen for one week. So we diluted in two weeks and a bit more. Let, but this was just um, the, triggering, um, the triggering event that brought us to think uh, much more about what we are doing. Uh, first of all, um, we are using um, uh, our modules are um, powered by uh, open edX and we are using uh, UC3M extension. Thank you very much uh, to the colleagues of uh, Carlos Tercero for having provided us. And this is a very flexible platform. We realized that we were not using its potential. Uh, we were just using a fraction of it because um, the way we designed it, it was just let's let's prepare some video, let's prepare some contents, let's upload on the platform and let's have the students going through that. But in fact, through the platform, we can do much more. And the platform, the, uh, this e-learning platform uh, is integrated, is connected with Blackboard Collaborate. So in the same place, we can have both, let's say, asynchronous contents that is being uh, looked by the students in a self-paced manner, as well as we have included into that our live session. Uh, so our, uh, the lectures uh, and uh, from the consultants, the uh, group work interaction and, and so on. But we thought that we could, uh, and it is, it seems very obvious right now, that we can uh, strengthen, even in the asynchronous part, um, the uh, interactions, like uh, adding forums. Um, so engaging students uh, much more with a, a lot of activities that goes uh, in towards the idea of having a sort of an active education. Huh? So not only telling them uh, asynchronous what they should read, but also uh, engaging them in uh, activities. 
as well as um, we have um, uh, we are planning to uh, enrich the contents including a practice based contents so videos not only on uh, let's say theoretical topics but also cases uh, from consultants and uh, videos interviews and uh, have assignments uh, related to that and even uh, peer to peer uh, reviewed mm -hmm. so the asynchronous part making uh, that was originally lost somewhere and given to students uh, it is uh, becoming uh, more and more uh, interactive also the um, synchronous part it, it it can become uh, deeper and can allow stronger interaction um, through uh, digital uh, through digital tools and um, in fact we have used uh, blackboard collaborate uh, but also uh, miro uh, and uh, other and students have uh, built up uh, google drive so we have uh, used um, remote interaction and we are going to keep it uh, also when hopefully next year we will be back to a in present face to face um, uh, week uh, face to face sessions in particular the way in which we organized um, in the face-to-face -face, um, interactive uh, week, it was so that every morning a different consulting company was coming, was giving a lecture, bringing a challenge, and following the students the whole day in their assignment, and discuss with them at the end of the day uh, what the different groups had done. Uh, this was uh, very uh, effective. Uh, we thought it was really creating value. On the other side, uh, when you give an assignment for a few hours, five to six, the kind of activities that students can do and the kind of interaction is rather limited. It can be a sort of a short simulation on the other side, what we are doing now and what we want to continue is to have longer assignments so that students can go deeper into what a consulting assignment is. This can be real or sort of real assignments that and also when we will be back to face to face, we will use the digital tools to start the, um, the assignment and to review at the end the assignment. So the consulting company will come one day for giving lectures, interacting with students, discussing with them in a, in a very uh, free way, but it wasn't, it will not be a one shot. They will have started digital, their interaction, and they will finish digital, their interaction. Third element, we were at started, we started, uh, in our uh, project relying only on our materials. So e our e-learning modules and our face-to-face um, uh, -face, uh, program. But uh, as Carlos highlighted, a part of mixing and blending, it's also getting parts from different sources. So um, we realized that there are, uh, in fact, very effective 
online modules, especially with respect to digital tools. And we have engaged in our program also um, a few uh, software, um, software companies. Here I'm mentioning SAS and SAP. And uh, together with them, we are offering the students um, the possibility to enrich also their portfolio of digital tools, having with them an introductory session, then leaving the students to do e-learning on their own uh, with respect to the digital tools they have selected, and then having a chance to discuss the learning and with respect to a um, reference assignment after the summer school. So we start this interaction beyond, uh, before the official summer school timing and we end it after the summer school uh, actual formal ending. So it is uh, more and uh, starting early and completing later, taking advantage of the self-paced um, uh, possibility of the e-learning platform. And we have seen that in this way, we can trigger uh, interesting, um, interesting knowledge and, uh, and contents. Uh, so students that may not have thought about taking a course on uh, SAS or SAP before the summer school, during it, they have started seeing the importance of analytics. Uh, and maybe they, they decide to hey say, hey, let me go for this visual analytics course. Or um, SAP, they have got uh, a lot of uh, tools related to uh, basic business process management as well as um, as well as analytics. So basically, now we are seeing a um, a project uh, path that is much richer in the use of uh, technologies in order to uh, support uh, interaction. So of course we are not growing. Uh, e-learning contents only, but we are growing in, in, in the quantity we are putting, but also deepening in terms of the tools and the interactions uh, we are using even in an uh, e-learning asynchronous um, uh, modules. We are enriching face-to-face -face interactions with technology or to be more precise, we will enrich because also this year, July 2021, uh, the summer school, uh, the, 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 the synchronous will be unfortunately uh, from remote. But our goal is, is, is in fact to enrich this face-to-face -face interaction and to have as a new normal uh, element of uh, technology uh, into it. And as a third element, we are not relying only on customized, uh, on our uh, customized developed e-learning contents, but also off the shelf e-learning contents, uh, introducing them, leveraging on them to strengthen the experience and the engagement of our participants. So this is not only blending, putting together in separate times the two elements, but really mixing them, shaking them in all the stages with the goal of increasing interaction with consultant and increasing practice-based contents. This is, um, this is my uh, overview on how we developed the project and how we revise it based on the uh, potentials uh, of uh, digital technologies, fostering uh, interaction and putting interaction in area 
that we hadn't thought uh, before. Of course, I will be glad at the end of the, this session to receive uh, questions on the project. And also, uh, if there are some of your students who may want to uh, take part to the July edition, we still have some places available for uh, Irun universities. Thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Corrado, for uh, uh, making clear what's behind the, the, the bus project, what we what the context is we're working in, and 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 how, how we changed our focus. Uh, yeah, uh, because we had to, but I think that many many good things have come out of it. So it's, uh, uh, I think that it gives it a very good. good, good. I see that normally we had Professor Pisoni on our uh, agenda, but uh, she is not there yet. Um, maybe um, if uh, I see Alfonso is 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 available, uh, is 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 present. Uh, Alfonso, can you see? Can you take uh, the first presentation uh, instead of uh, Galena? Um, uh, can you maybe put your micro on in it so I can see that you really uh, are available? Alfonso? Yes, for sure. Okay, thank you. Then we go to our first expert, and I, I'm sure Kalena will join us later. Um, Alfonso, you can start uh, loading your presentation if, if you want. Uh, Professor Bustos is, is, is a learning scientist with a experience in corporate learning. He's now working on topics like future of higher education, future of work, uh, combination of work and, high, and, and learning, learning at the workspace, uh, learner experience and digital transformation. So please, thank you, uh, Alfonso, to be so flexible and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luke, for this opportunity. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, thank you, very clear, thank you. Good, thank you so much. Thank you to the previous presenters. Very interesting, Carlos, I'm professor uh, from Italy. I think that it's very interesting to understand this teaching transformation and for sure the main object is for BATS project. I really appreciate your kind presentation and even I will try to connect your, your proposals with my presentation for sure. I will share with you some ideas about this provocative idea related with hybrid learning in a hybrid work context. From my perspective, right now is very important to share this in different ways to analyze, to follow, and to understand how the learning at the workplace is changing right now. During the last year, it was very impressive how universities and uh, teaching spaces were changing because the lockdowns in, 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 in the world. But the hybrid uh, work context, they are changing too. And the learning opportunities this in, in this uh, uh, work environment is important. Then from my perspective, this idea is very well related with the building up digital strategies project, how we can follow this transformation in the workspaces, and uh, how we can or should uh, follow the evolution of learning in corporate spaces. We have a lot uh, of great examples with, for instance, with Novartis or Visa or some other big companies in which um, forms they transform the learning opportunities. Then from my perspective, we from the universities and more, more important in this kind of program as bots, we need to be close, very close to this learning transformation in the corporate learning environment. Then for this uh, proposal, I want to share some ideas about how the hybrid world context is leading or moving or transforming the hybrid learn opportunities at the corporate level and how we can learn something about learning opportunities, learning processes, learning technologies, and even how to mobilize these digital strategies mindset in the process. First of all, let me share with you that the future of work is a big, big topic, not only for working spaces, for corporate um, environments, but for all of us in the world even more in the universities. The future of war swept in sooner than expected because of the uh, COVID-19. 
we observe a, an urgent need for new maps, new mindsets, new strategies responding, for instance, to the definition of work itself. We need to change these ideas. The work as an activity, not as a place, is a great idea that we are using in the last uh, months, trying to understand this work as an activity. And it's very important to do this, not as a place. For sure that we are transforming the workspaces in the, in, the, in, the big, in the big corporations. We are defining working times. You know that we are trying to understand how to, to combine this, this working from home, but with working at the office, which kind of combination could be better? Do you remember maybe that several companies defined a few months ago the full model in, in working from home. Right now, they are changing the perspective. You remember, for instance, Netflix or Spotify or some other companies as Google, that they are trying to change or to adapt or to be flexible in this definition of working times and working spaces. Neither the full uh, time at the office or the full time working from home it's doing, it's being the, 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 the final model. We are working in different models and working interaction are very relevant. And from my perspective, how this kind of activity mediated by technology at working spaces is, able, is, is transforming, is moving forward, give us a great opportunity to understand several aspects regards the, the, the way in which we learn and how can we promote this hybrid learning in this hybrid working context? For us as individuals, as an organization, and even as communities, COVID has supposed an accelerator to the future. Let's see how this, this is happening. For instance, uh, I think that you, you, you agree with me that the accelerated future of work is, is coming. We are living right now this kind of, you know, digital transformation accelerated by seven, 10 years, maybe several reports of fair information about this, how we are moving or how we, we, we move more than seven or 10 years in this digital transformation. But the real opportunity right now, we think and several uh, thinkers think that is not to do the same that uh, we have done in the past. We need to try to change not only a little bit better or a little bit faster, the real opportunity is explore or to explore a different journey. And this different journey maybe led us to discover how we can think differently. I'm very happy because this quote from John Maynard Keynes was used by Carlos from uh, the University Carlos III. I, and I think that this is a great quote. These two, the difficulty is not to, so much in developing new ideas as in escaping from old ones. This idea is that, yes, we have a lot of experience with blended learning, more than 20 years maybe. We have a lot of experience with e-learning, but what we need is to ask different questions and to promote different models and to have new idea, ideas. For instance, how we can produce different results with more impact and more meaning for students, for teachers, et cetera. How can we create new combinations of human machine teams reinforcing the unique capabilities of each? Because this will happen soon. The combination of human and machines at workplace and in the learning spaces. How can we create more flexible ways of working for all selves and members of the workforce. And what I mean with flexible ways of working is that we need to create flexible ways of interaction, flexible, flexible ways of sharing knowledge, flexible ways of constructing knowledge, flexible ways of sharing in, or having interaction at the workplace. And how we can create workplaces that combine our ability to work virtually and in person. And this, workplaces are a very relevant relevant uh, uh, topic. I think that companies that are moving faster, changing the workplaces. My, my question is if universities, as, as us, all of us, all of all our universities, we are moving, thinking differently in this, in this way, creating different teaching or learning workplaces. Or what we want is to use the same places because it's the way in which we have done in the past and we have no new ideas for this. I think that hybrid learning 
should think in different workplaces or different learning places for the future. And this is a great opportunity to think about it. We know because we have a lot of reports that the future of work will be hybrid and, and remote work is here to stay. For instance, Capgemini, they have this kind of report uh, showing us that the organization, they are moving to this kind of uh, hybrid work in several areas, not only in IT or digital, but customer service, finance, sales, and human resources, for sure, as you can see in this graphic. And even more, we are seeing new movement in this kind of hybrid world for risk and compliance, for instance, or for research and development or innovation. That's good. That sounds like good news because not only the traditional areas, very well connected with hybrid work, they are moving faster. In the companies, in the corporate uh, ecosystem, we are moving faster in several areas promoting this kind of hybrid world that I, I repeat is here to stay. The fundamental question right now, I think that about this disrupted uh, work, have these ideas that I want to share with you because I think that could be interesting to make some question like this regards hybrid learning. What lens are we choosing as we look ahead? Are we using the same lens that in the past? That means that blended learning in the past was good, but will be good in the future. We need to, to use several different lenses in order to, to make different questions. Are we viewing the future as an extension of predictable past? Or are we viewing the future as a broad set of new opportunities? I think that we need to, show, to, to see these uh, new opportunities related to hybrid learning with different lens and to create different possibilities for the future. How we will deal with the hybrid world paradox. And for me, this is important. We know that uh, several companies are defining this hybrid world paradox. The paradox is this, the vast majority of employees say they want more flexible remote work options. But at the same time, also say they want more in-person collaboration post pandemic. That's the paradox. I'm wondering if we in the universities, in these learning spaces at BOT, are we confronting this paradox too? Are we, we, we are thinking in this paradox too? We have identified this paradox too of hybrid learning, how the learners they prefer, how they want to combine this both uh, learning spaces. I think that hybrid learning will be in a paradox soon. And we will be able to, to ask questions and even to, to look for answer to this paradox. And I think that we all should think about this paradox and reflect about this uh, aspect re related with how learners, they want to resolve this kind of combination. And for sure, we need to make questions to them. We need to co-create with, with them. We need to analyze the learner experience and to co-create with them the way in which we will be offering hybrid learning environment. It's a great opportunity, I suppose, from my perspective, in order to, to share with the learners the opportunity to share with us what they think about these hybrid learning spaces, context, etc. Let me share with you that this kind of recommendation for shifting to a hybrid workforce future is interesting for me in order to think how hybrid learning will be defining in the future. For instance, this report from Capet Gemini 2 established a business case for the target hybrid operating model. And after that, they are working in tailored employee experience to adapt to a hybrid operating model. I'm wondering if, if we are thinking how to tailor the learner, the learner experience to adapt to a hybrid operating model at the school, at university, at the spaces at bots that want to develop these kind of skills in order to promote these kind of learning experiences. We have these four areas in this new hybrid working paradigm in, 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 in workforce future. For instance, rethink the sourcing model to enable delivery where you are. 
this is important because corporate learning, corporate uh, organization, they are thinking in how to deliver where you are, how to offer this opportunity. This is flexibility. Related with leadership, they are thinking how leaders, they are encouraging autonomy, empathy, and transparency in order to promote this kind of autonomous working, this kind of process in which the people, they will manage themselves. We need in, in the corporate level to, to reinvent the culture to create this work culture with new collective rituals. We know that that's very important, which kind of culture we will be transforming at the university level, at the school level. Um, finally, the workplace, how we will be installing a robust digital infrastructure to accelerate seamless digital working. This kind of thinking at workplaces, at corporate level is very important. And I'm wondering how the universities, we are defining this digital infrastructure for the future in order to accelerate the hybrid learning. If we are doing the same that we done in the past, maybe we will be creating the same learning models. And from my perspective, we need to define a different way to create this infrastructure and to create these, these learning places. And finally, shape of organizational address to, 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 to connect with the needs of the hybrid learning experiences. This is the model from workforce future. And I think that we need to follow, which must to follow this in order to create or to reinvent the hybrid learning perspective. Let me share with you some aspect related with the future work that from my perspective is learning. Yes, I'm sure that the future of work will be learning. The role of learning in the workplace right now is very, very relevant. We are in a very interesting moment at uh, the workplace in order to promote skill, reskilling, upskilling, and even to create in new ways to support learning experiences. For instance, uh, we have opened its opportunity in this regard as people have become more familiar with online learning. We know that right now there are much more people at work uh, level at the workspace that, that they want to follow in with virtual collaboration, learning in virtual spaces, using as, as you know, Coursera, several kind of resources to learn because they have been, they have been being great experiences with these, these virtual learning experiences. They have this kind of, you know, combination of corporate and individual levels for develop online skills training not only soft skill or power skills as Bersin uh, call, but technical skills too. I will uh, be sharing some examples of this. But what is happening right now is that we are creating new learning habits at level, uh, at, at workplace level. Uh, we are creating new ways of working with these new learning habits. Then there are a great movement here at corporate level connecting learning, curiosity, upskilling, reskilling with new ways of working, new ways of interaction. I think that the future of work will be interesting for us as a teachers, as a universities in order to connect with the experience that how people will be working in the future and how will the people will be learning at workplace in the future. We know because this kind of reports give us great information about this, that we are scaling the remote world, we are accelerated digitalization, and we are accelerated automation too. This uh, World Economic Forum report for last year, 2020, but at the end of the year, that is very interesting for this year, share with us that we need to reskill in the 50% of all employees in all around the world. A big, big, big challenge. More than a half of the employees will need reskilling by 2025. Then we need to understand how to promote this kind of learning, how to improve this kind of learning spaces, learning connection. And I think that bots, your project is a great opportunity, not only to, to offer ideas, but to learn how corporate learning, they are moving faster and how they are doing. And 40% of the current workers' core skills are expected to change in the next five years. Imagine the challenge. The reskilling needs will be a great challenge in the next five years for all of us. 
because as you say before, the, 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 the presenters, employability is very important. Digital transformation will be a key component. And what we need from this project is trying to understand how the world will be a challenge, uh, how learning will be a great opportunity in workplace level. The, this linking report related with work, workplace learning uh, give us information about upskilling or skilling is a priority for L&D across globally. As you can see here, for all L&D areas globally, upskilling or skilling is the most important priority in the business. That suppose that learning is important for the future of work, that learning is the future of work. And we have entered in the era built on resilience and digital fluency. And I think that this is very important because BOTS is related with digital strategists. Building on resilience is the most important soft skills, the most important capability, human capability that we are developing in this. We are talking about, we are developing in, in all corporate contexts and digital fluency will be the most important component, not only at corporate level or university, but for all, all nations, for all citizenship, we need to create this digital fluency in the future for, for under, or in order to create this development. The Work Economic Forum report gives us some ideas about these emerging skills. As you can see the five most important related with analytical thinking, active learning and learning strategies, critical thinking and analysis, creativity, complex problem solving, technology. Then I'm wondering how at the university level we will be working, developing these kind of skills in the, in the students. How the learners will be able to have experiences in order to develop these, these relevant competencies, these relevant capabilities. At corporate level, they are developing this, how we will uh, lead with this kind of uh, needs of the learners for the future. And if you see here, for instance, for Spain, it's important to have this information. The, the companies will be retraining existing employees in the 90% of them. That's very important because they will need learning models, learning tools, learning experiences. They will need people as digital strategies in order to promote how to retrain employees in order to increase their employability and to have a new opportunity in the, in the workspace. Some of them will be looking for automated work. That is a challenge for sure, the combination of uh, robots, uh, artificial intelligence, and how this will change the, the work scenario. And in the other level, they will be hiring new staff with the skills relevant to new technologies. This is a great point because the new talent in the organization will be, I suppose, I hope, the talent that the university will be, will be preparing for this. How we as a project, as a, even as a university, preparing these blended learning opportunities, hybrid learning models, how we'll be putting the most important part of the training process of the learning process in these skills relevant related with new technologies. Porque, because the, the employability will be very, very connected with this kind of resources. Then from my perspective, this is very important in order to think about this. Let me finish with this main ideas related with an example, the Microsoft strategy in order to understand how to promote this hybrid work and how to connect with, with learning experiences. Microsoft defined these three main aspects of uh, or the hybrid model, people, places, and processes. I think that are very important because of flexibility and when, where, and how people work. And if we change work for learn, this will be important. Our we are thinking in this right now, flexibility in when, where, and how people learn. We are thinking in a different way in how we use the spaces, not only the physical location, but the physical and virtual location to collaborate, how spaces will need to be reimagined in the university level. For me, it's very important. And the second part is consider how to reduce the volume of traditional meetings in the workplace by uses asynchronous communication and collaboration tools. Seems very, very irrelevant, but not. 
The meetings are very important at corporate level, even for learning from, from each other. There are several information related with how these asynchronous methods help provide feedback, brainstorm, share content, and ideas. But the main question is if people are workspaces, they are using the meeting for this, that are the relevant interaction, receiving and giving feedback, creating new ideas, proposing new models, sharing content, huh? challenging ideas. Right now, we have a great movement in order to create these spaces in order to do this. From my perspective, we need to think about this and how to use these ideas in the university in the hybrid blended learning models because the most important asynchronous or even virtual meetings will be related or could be related with this, how people receive or provide feedback, how we create thinking together, how we create uh, uh, new products together, how we share contents, then how the work context, they are changing the way in which, the way in which they meet, they share ideas, could be an interesting model in order to understand how to promote hybrid learning new opportunities. You can see here, for instance, that they are in Microsoft, they are using Teams in different moments. But I think that it's important to share with you that they are thinking in these three components before, during, and after a meeting, how we can use the resources, the same resources, the same suite in order to change the interaction before, during, and after. In hybrid learning, we need to think about this, not only in this virtual space or even face-to-face -face space, a separated space. No, we need to think in this as a continuous. And we need to think what we have done, we have promoted to, to doing before, during, and after this process. For instance, you can use SharePoint team to provide a secure landing place in order to communicate some ideas before. We can make general announcement in the same SharePoint news or even in a Teams in order to send in a channel some information to give more information. And we can use team, the chat or the channels or a meetings or even the notes or even the recording of the notes in order to touch base with a teammate or a partner and to get up to speed. Then I think that here we have an interesting and different model about asynchronous methods because it's important to combine this synchronicity with asynchronous possibilities. I think that this is a big challenge and a great opportunity to do this. Microsoft is building a collaborative technology platform and I think that this is important. The technology as, as uh, Carlos uh, shared with us in the, in the previous presentation is moving fast in all of these F tech companies. They are offering things like Zoom, Microsoft, Cisco, Salesforce, Google, Facebook. They are moving because they will be create virtual meetings, collaboration, knowledge management, safe workplace well-being, and video sharing. And are, they are changing faster and faster and faster. If you remember Teams uh, six months ago, were very different than right now, because they are moving, trying to understand the interaction, trying to understand how people interact, how people learn, how people share, how what people expect for this. And they are moving faster, changing in this, you know, in this uh, rapid prototyping process. It's the same with uh, Zoom. Always there are new version with a new future, with new possibilities. This is a great lesson from, for all of us in the university, because I think that blended learning, hybrid learning need to move faster in how to use these several, these several platforms in order to move it. No? I think that there are a great opportunity to understand how employees, in the, in the work context, they are uh, uh, claiming this kind of credential, this kind of budgets in order to, to build up their expertise, how they are uh, trying to ask for personalized training content to employees and how the companies, they are offer, offering these kind of learning opportunities within the flow of the work. That means moving the, the learning opportunities more beyond th that classroom or, or the, the classroom experience. I think that this is a great example of distributed uh, teaching, distributed learning. The people should or could learn 
in several spaces as a continuum. The work uh, spaces, they are moving faster in this way. I think that the, the work of the future will be learning in all the spaces, learning and as a continuous, learning in the flow of the work. And this should give us at the university level some kind of information of how people will be learning in the companies, learning while working. That is for me a great, a great component. Let me finish with these five ideas that I think that could be relevant for this future of work that from my perspective is learning. Create a plan to empower people for extreme flexibility. We need to think if hybrid learning need this kind of extreme flexibility, invest in a space and technology to bridge the physical and digital worlds, that's very important. For sure that technology is not the key component, but we need to understand which technology and how to bridge the physical and digital world. That's the main challenge right now for hybrid learning context, how to bridge these both. It's not necessary to think from my perspective, sorry, to think in separate worlds, the, the virtual campus and the real campus. I think that was this was the past model. We need to think in how to bridge this and how technology will let us to do this. Combat digital exhaustion from the top. That's important in corporate level, but I think that is important at the university too because our hybrid um, learning will be a, a risk for, for wellness, for health. And we need at the university level to think in the teacher's health, student's health about the use of these kind of resources. I, I think that this is an, a very, very important topic. We need to, to think how to rebuild in social capital and culture. That's important at the corporate level, but I think that this should be great in order to give the teams this opportunity to reframe networks, building how to connect with several people at the university level, with several teachers, with teachers beyond the university, with teachers, researchers, I don't know, some other people beyond the university. That's distributed learning. That's hybrid learning. I think that this is a new model. And we need to ring at, uh, 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 at work uh, force level, we need to rethink employee experience to compete from the best and most diverse talent. This will be a challenge in the employability and for the, for the companies. But I think that a learner experience will be a big challenge at the university level. If hybrid learning models are important and relevant is because we need to create a new learner experience, a different learner experience. And I think that this is the biggest challenge for us and begins with how we will be thinking about the new learner experience at university in this hybrid learning model. Thank you so much for, for, for your attention and thank you so much for, for this. Thank you, Alfonso. Thank you for giving us this workplace perspective. I had to realize during your session, you mentioned bridging the physical and digital world. I, I realized that, that, that maybe, I'm, I'm, I'm hesitating also to, to talk before and after, but still a few years ago, I think that there was a huge difference between the way students learn at universities and, stu and, and, and young employees or employees worked in the workplace. And, and I, I think that the, the present situation really gives us an opportunity, opportunity to, uh, to, to come to close to each other. I think that the, the, the way the students will learn at universities, or I think we should, uh, should be closer to the way uh, people work and, and the other way around. I mean, you mentioned l and or and I'm not, not sure whether you mentioned that, but we're talking easily about research and development. We, are we should talking about learning and development. I mean, th this, is, this is something, uh, uh, a concept that we, we, we could use. Thank you very much for your uh, inspiring view on, 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 on blended learning. Thank you very much. Alfonso. Thank you, Luke. At the same time, I say Galena uh, joined us. Galena had some technical issues, uh, but uh, we're glad that you're on board now. And uh, I would like to give you the floor for your presentation. You, I see that your presentation is already uploaded. Uh, Professor Pisoni, Galena Pisoni is coordinator for innovation and entrepreneurship at the University of Cote d'Azur. She teaches innovation and entrepreneurship for computer science students. Uh, and coordinate projects towards innovation and entrepreneurship. So a lot of entrepreneurship. So we're very um, keen to, to, to hear your perspective uh, from your point of view. Elena, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Luke, and uh, hi all. So thank you for this introduction. And uh, what I will give as a complimentary view to this talk is uh, for the different strategies that we use for implementing blended learning at a European scale. So I personally am part of uh, EIT Digital. I don't know how many of you are familiar with EIT Digital, but uh, I will say it's, um, uh, it's a multifaceted uh, entity and we have at the, at the core there is also an education part and, uh, how, and the strategies basically we implemented for this big consortium to be using blended, uh, blended learning. So as said, so part of the mission of EIT Digital, it's, uh, it's a knowledge and innovation community from the European Union, is to train uh, computer science IT graduates in uh, both a master and doctoral, doctoral level. Uh, usually bachelor students are not of our interest, but we train as said, computer science students with strong uh, innovation and entrepreneurship com competencies. So having said this, uh, I imagine you ask uh, how are these uh, programs structured? We have a master school and we have a doctoral school. Uh, basically, within the masters, besides the computer science technical uh, major, the students are also following a minor in what we call innovation and entrepreneurship, and we train them to become more innovative and entrepreneurial. And this is usually out of 120 ECTS. We speak about uh, 30 ECTS going to going to this aim out of the, out of the studies for the, for the students, while the other is uh, fully technical courses that they follow. And uh, this, you can imagine that it's implemented uh, uh, as also the title of my talk says uh, pan-European, which means that we have uh, 15 to, we have uh, 18 to 20 universities that implement uh, our blended uh, uh, in education. So as you can imagine, to implement uh, blended education and to be thinking even about, uh, uh, we started really early when I, I don't know how, um, it was that uh, around uh, 2014, we already had 2013, 2014, we had a clear idea back uh, when back at the time, it was still that we were teaching only on campus. We had uh, this idea that, okay, no, uh, online and uh, blending uh, and introducing more of online inside uh, campus teaching will be coming and will be making the way. So we, as a first step, we said like, okay, in order to be doing this uh, online and blended learning, what we need to do is we need to start producing content and to, to, to have these online contents that are later our teachers in uh, the network of universities will be using. So we started in 2014 with the aim that we will be producing these online contents. And we have uh, seven, because you can imagine out of this network, out of uh, 18, 20 universities, not everyone can produce um, a content because you need to have a studio. Uh, the teacher needs to be willing to be in front of a camera, a good uh, production quality. So we had seven universities that were able and volunteer. And I mean, okay, they, there was a financial also mechanism behind, but they, they were what we call the teacher's producers so because uh, our objective is we are based on the premise of teachers producers and then we have uh, a more than 45 hours of videos at the moment and uh, the videos are usually what we have is this uh, big database of online contents and the videos are okay we we followed uh, all the good practices for production of videos that is the videos are around 10 minutes length but then we combine combine them in a bundle of one hour and they are organized across the teams. So like uh, there are several teams, one can be thinking about uh, different, different aspects of uh, technology entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship and innovation in general. And uh, what we do is okay, so we are speaking here also, okay, we have this uh, database of online videos. And uh, the main question that we had is how can we needed to basically visit all universities and how can university actually use these contents for teaching. So part of my mission was that we, I, together with my colleagues, we were visiting the universities 
and uh, we were explaining first what these online contents are and second we were studying strategies on how basically they can adopt uh, inside their teaching how, how they can adopt these uh, how, how they can use online contents as you can imagine it's also really personal like the way how i use online teaching in my course it's uh, for sure different than what other people would like and everyone has its own uh, approach to teaching blended learning. So out of this, we, I base uh, what I present today, the strategies uh, for blended learning. So just, just to say that, okay, we started in 2014 and 15, we had uh, generic uh, production of content on so innovation and entrepreneurship, 16 and 17, it was technology entrepreneurship was the focus uh, of our production. And then uh, 2018, 2019, digital transformation. And we still uh, produce a lot of contents about digital transformation. So as said, when visiting, um, and this was a little bit of a bottom up approach, and it wasn't top down approach, because you can imagine that when you work with such a big uh, consortium and understanding how people can be using these videos was, uh, was also not easy. So we had this more kind of uh, bottom up approach and how, how are the models that the different people can be using uh, these contents within their own teaching. So as you can imagine, we have uh, the most obvious and uh, like uh, for, the, for the, um, the professors who are really ready that, okay, they needed this meant that uh, they needed to watch first the videos to be teaching with flipped classroom. So we had uh, people teaching with uh, flipped classroom in a sense that, uh, okay, they were first asking the students to watch the videos at home. And when the students were coming on campus, they were basically discussing with them the content scene. But this is really, this was really good, but it required also that the professors are really keen on first watching themselves the videos and being really open that now the class is not just a lecture time in which I lecture, but it meant also that uh, it, now it becomes a discussion time. And it's not that everyone is really comfortable with having, be changing the classroom like this. Then uh, some were even really full adopters of this online education and blended learning. So they did uh, what we call the full blended online course. And that is they had uh, everything online, assignments um, and uh, online sessions. And then again, uh, some classes, the classes were more just a kind of supervision of small, of small tasks. Then we have uh, another approach, uh, which is kind of called uh, online starter kit, which is that usually some professors did not like to be maybe disturbed a lot in their courses with online, uh, with online uh, lessons. So what we did is that prior to coming to the course, we made bundles of online content that students can watch and maybe quizzes to take or peer review assignments. And then uh, when they come, or for instance, in the summer school, and when they come for the course, uh, they are prepared basically for taking, uh, for taking the course. Because we also had this problem that uh, different specializations require different backgrounds, and maybe not all the students have the same ba background. So we observed that also this way of uh, using the online content in a kind of online starter kit way was really, um, was really useful for some professors because it was helping them to bring the students on the same level. And then usually inside the course, one can have one, one hour session discussion, but it's more kind of generic discussion to understand if this, uh, if the content really made their, um, made the, exactly what they were aimed for, and if they really, all the students are really aligned on the knowledge. And then we have like uh, the use of the contents in uh, kind of independent leveling up, and that is that we have a repository and then the students basically, we also uh, train the teachers how to open only like a selected session to students. And then it's uh, like uh, this allowed also to have really individual approach. So for instance, I think that one student needs to be having um, a specific misses a knowledge on marketing, for instance, I can open this session only on marketing. Or for instance, another student misses entrepreneurial finance competencies, I can open only this. So we, we worked also on this approach and that is another strategy that we had on training the teachers to be able to open only specific sessions so they can give kind of more personalized approach for the students. And, uh, oh, sorry, that was the online repository and independent leveling up. It was just um, letting the students do everything on their own. And then only if needed, uh, teachers can be, can be there to help. 
But uh, as you can say, we have a lot of uh, lessons learned uh, and experiences from this project, and it's uh, it's really big, it's uh, it's ongoing, and uh, I just have some visualizations on what what did it mean in terms of effort, like pre-class, in-class, and post-class to be having these uh, these kind of approaches. So in pre-class, in flipped classroom, usually okay, it's mandatory. For students to watch the materials and then in class there is a really high workload in a sense that one needs to materialize the the learning that uh, that was gained and uh, this is um this is one example that for instance um, as a pre of a flipped classroom and that is that as a pre-assignment student watches home uh, two videos on business modeling and then inside business modeling, we uh, inside the class, we do assessing of how students actually internalized this learning and how they applied it immediately in a project because they work inside business development lab, they work on projects and they need to apply the learning inside the, inside the project. Then, uh, like for instance, this uh, full online course, again, we have a, a strong, uh, in a strong focus on watching the materials before coming to class and then in class is again uh, clarifications and practice but uh, the only difference is that the whole course uh, is composed basically of sessions like this so kind of the in-class support is um, is there but it's uh, the, the whole teaching happens uh, happens online and uh, this is uh, this is one example. Like all the sessions will be composed like this, and that is that there is a pre-assignment, and uh, then in class it's more kind of clarifications and examples and group works. And then uh, this is um, for what I mentioned as online starter kit, and that is before someone before the students come on campus, they are supposed to watch a set of videos and then they come all aligned uh, on, on the knowledge uh, for, for the course and they can follow the course. And this is, um, this is the example of uh, what we have as a, uh, the summer school and we have a set of online contents the students need to watch on, need to watch prior to going to the summer school to get prepared and uh, to get adequately prepared to follow the summer school. So we have uh, five, uh, five modules and that is uh, introduction to assessing uh, impact of uh, uh, ICT, then business modeling, entrepreneurial finance, marketing, and pitching. And uh, this we usually combine with clickers, with uh, quizzes, so that it makes it easy for the students to, uh, it makes it easy also for us to understand if the students really gained, uh, gained the needed knowledge. And then we know also on which teams the students are not having uh, in-depth knowledge, like usually, uh, from our experience in these last uh, years that I've seen for our students, because we have around uh, 400, 500 students per year, students always come a little prepared on marketing, but this is also something that we learned through the years uh, in, uh, in our setting. And this, uh, as I said, this approach really helps that one really learns. So even if they come a little prepared because we do quizzes, so we understand that uh, what is their knowledge, and then they can they can learn on their own, and then um, and then we know also what was the test after they followed the exams uh, after they followed the quizzes that they took, and we know how prepared they come to our on on class sessions. And uh, this is like uh, one example of the independent learning. So students, for instance, watch content before and they do assignments after the class, but basically within class uh, stays uh, quite invited. And for instance, this is uh, one example on how uh, this is implemented at Alto. And as I'm not on my computer, the visualization is not, uh, is not interactive. It is more interactive, but basically it's to say that the, the online module is coming before on, on class and then uh, one, um, when, when it's on site, the class stays as it is, but uh, these online contents were used just to prepare the students to come, to come on campus. And uh, as you can imagine, all of this, and this is the repository, what I'm mentioning, that is that we train the teachers that uh, they know how to open only dedicated sessions to, to this kind of personalized approach to students that uh, need help on a specific team. 
So this also allowed us, and I will uh, just give two examples to kind of, uh, because we have this central approach and uh, we have the central platform, but you can imagine that this allowed us even within this uh, consortium of 18, 20 universities to have uh, collaborations because now before the students were everyone attending a class in his own university, but now uh, having this online virtual shared space, we can do assignments together. So as you can imagine, we have like this uh, full online course, but then uh, two students from two different universities can, can join the same online course. We also had the added value that, for instance, we can work on shared assignments online, so we have all the same contents, and then the students can work even on different aspects of the same of the same assignment. And uh, just to kind of conclude, I will go just to the next to the, my last slide is that uh, I presented these approaches that we took to blending our education. And uh, okay, some different models had uh, different uh, efficiency, you can imagine, but uh, for us it was more to understand, okay, what is, um, what works better for which situation and uh, okay, for, for different also professors and for different professor styles as well, not only for students, but we had also with the repository and uh, also the different approaches were, really mirrored to fit uh, different students but also to, and different knowledge but also to fit uh, different uh, professors uh, styles uh, especially regarding teaching innovation and entrepreneurship which is not an easy task for computer science students so yeah we have been working on this and we continue working on this and this created also this space and possibility for creating cross university collaborations and um, yeah, I think that with this, I will be concluding my talk and I will leave the floor if someone has a question or um, thoughts, reflections. I, I am sorry, I'm awful that I don't, uh, don't check uh, chat. So I see that there are some questions, but. <laughs> Galena, did we, did we uh, agree that uh, uh, questions will be taken after the session, after all sessions? And uh, the, you. You, you, you have time now to, to, to look at the chat if that's, if that's valid. It's a good moment to say that um, uh, you, you can put uh, questions in the chat. Some of the of you of the participants have already uh, sent their, their, their questions on the chat to the panelists. Uh, so maybe it's not because you haven't seen any questions that there haven't been any questions. So our panelists have already seen them. You can send them to all attendees or send them to the panelists. So please, if you have questions uh, or reflections about the presentation of uh, Galena, Alfonso, and Corrada, and Carlos from the beginning, but then, then I said that already at that moment, please write them down or put them in the chat. I will take them at, at the end. Thank you very much, Galena. It was interesting to see those models again um, at the first uh, idea, uh, but is within the online starter kit. You mentioned that even the summer school, but we're all in all in all kind of models. And, and it's it just uh, uh, certainly uh, a challenge to, to make sure that we, we, we use all the uh, all the tools and all the, the, the whole uh, spectrum of possibilities. And uh, and you, you refer to uh, the Penn University was in your in your title as well, and cross university collaboration. Um, well, with the European universities uh, now coming, uh, more, getting more important, I think that uh, your 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 plans and your uh, strategies and our models will be becoming more and more important to have uh, within uh, defined uh, uh, university groups, groups of universities to have more intensive collaboration. Thank you very much for that. Okay, then we can go to. No, Thank just, you, just I wanted to comment, Luke, on that, that I fully agree with you. And indeed, uh, I didn't put further steps, but uh, what uh, actually the further steps are, are within this, uh, all of these developments that you mentioned, European universities. Now there is higher education initiative, uh, which again collects all the different universities and all this knowledge has been seen extremely useful in those settings. So, yes. yes. And where well, we work together in, in projects like, like this one, which is interesting. Um, but the, the advantage of universities is that you have a more stable uh, position uh, to work on and stable groups of universities, so you can um, work more more further on uh, on, on stable uh, expertise building. Thank you very much. It doesn't mean that we don't have to communicate within European universities or between European universities as well. Of course. <laughs> I'm following. 
Yeah, I would be a risk that we focus on our own university, European university, and we don't have any contacts anymore with others. We don't, we're not going to do that. We, we, no, no. We, <laughs> okay, let you go, Lena. Thank, um, thank you, Lou. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, next on the, uh, just the last expert on the agenda is Marco. Thanks for waiting, Marco. Um, you can upload your presentation if you uh, want. Uh, Marco is Professor of Technology Enhanced Learning at the Heidelberg University of Education. And Marco also uh, is affiliated to the UNESCO Chair of Open University at the Open, Uni Open Education of the Open University in the Netherlands. And next to Open Education, his research uh, interest lies in specific technologies and formative assessments. Uh, Marco, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Luc, for the introduction. Um, hello, all. I'm happy to be invited to this BUDS online event. And I think um, the project is pretty much on time of putting the topic of blended and hybrid learning at the table. Um, Alfonso has uh, talked about different lenses uh, to look at hybrid and branded learning. I will uh, focus on a design uh, lens and share some experience um, of our research on, on scaling of education. So I think to talk about the topic of blended learning, it's always good to um, have to take a step back in the historical development of, of blended learning. Um, I used to work in 2002 in a project where um, we try to develop solutions in higher education institutions, uh, which pretty much worked in offline and online mode. So the origins of the blended and hybrid came from a time in which internet access was not pervasive. And uh, the idea was always that uh, you would combine offline and online activities. Of course, in today's times, uh, this um, differentiation between offline and online uh, is not there anymore. And I think we have uh, opportunities to think in different ways about blended learning. Um, and there are, of this uh, time, there are some theory-informed models of blended learning um, with a vision in mind of combining uh, brick and mortar uh, kind of teaching uh, and online learning. And there have been different ways to do this combination. This is from Horn and Staker, uh, one of the few theory-based uh, blended learning proposals in which they differentiate an enriched virtual model, an a la carte model, a flex model, and then a rotation model in, in which lab um, and flipped classroom designs are uh, combined. Um, looking back at the practices, but also the research on blended learning, I think we have to state that um, there was before the pandemic a pretty much an approach of anything goes. So you can do everything online, you can uh, do everything face to face, uh, different combinations are, are possible and valid. And um, the most designs uh, were kind of trying different combinations. So, uh, and I think this has changed now radically in the current pandemic experience. Um, also because we realized that what was in the model, the brick and mortar part, the presence meeting face to face is precious. It's a precious quality, which we are all missing at the moment. So meeting people face to face, um, interacting in a face to face situation has a specific quality um, which might not be easily um, enhanced in a purely online mode. Uh, and I think this experience is also bringing higher education institutions worldwide uh, to discuss blended and hybrid learning models of the future currently, uh, because nobody knows uh, if uh, and how long we need to um, maintain these kind of models. Uh, because it could still be that some groups of our learners will not be uh, able to attend face-to-face -face sessions 
I just saw at the, at the chat that there was also a question on the presentation by Carlos. So serving uh, local and uh, remote participants at the same time. I think this is the reality we are facing right now that we really need to rethink hybrid and blended learning in higher education institutions. And I would like to add to this situation description another challenge that higher education institutions are facing already quite some time, and this is a scalability problem. Um, so you see here an expected growth of students uh, in the next uh, 10 years. Um, and there was recently an all on IQ uh, report, which is quoted like, it's not clear how current education systems and models will scale to support the scenario meeting the challenges we find in today's environment while scaling to meet these opportunities. So uh, we have this current situation with the pandemic, but at the same time, we have a long-term challenge of higher education institutions uh, to rethink how they can serve larger groups of learners within the next 10 years. And um, I'm not sure how it is in your countries, but I'm seeing in the academic community quite some pressure to go back to the old uh, reality, to go back to a full face-to-face um, -face teaching mode as soon as possible. Uh, I would say it would be a pity if we wouldn't take this opportunity and every crisis is also an opportunity to rethink the way we deliver a higher education and how we use the brick and mortar presence and how we use the online presence and to do it more intelligently um, based on instructional decision-making and not randomly putting together activities online and on location. Uh, I would like to share with you some pointers or some guidelines we could use as an orientation for future design of blended and hybrid um, learning. And the first one uh, is coming, uh, or, the, or the other component that we need to rethink is the scalability challenge. So how can we redesign higher education to scale up and to increase also uh, interaction quality uh, in our learning environments. And this is typically, typically uh, a mission that has been driven by the open universities. And there is a huge expectation that this mission can be uh, redesigned based on new technologies, services, and economies of scale. Um, but we need to be careful not to, um, not to misunderstand learning at scale as a concept because learning at scale, uh, learning with many, or uh, teaching with many, many learners out there. And we took this uh, research from a MOOC context in which you often have thousands of learners at the same time. Learning at scale is not the same like having educational scalability available. Because educational scalability would be the capacity of an educational format to maintain a high quality despite increasing or large numbers of learners at a stable level of total costs. So educational scalability is something different than learning at scale. Learning scale just says, okay, we have high numbers of learners and we're serving them. Uh, but the question is, are we able to do that with the same quality? And one of the models that has been around for many years is the so-called iron triangle. Uh, and the iron triangle uh, is uh, easy to understand. It um, has three sides, its scale, its quality, and its costs. And there, there is a rule that you cannot optimize all three dimensions at the same time, because if you optimize two, the third one will suffer. So that's, I would say, the general challenge of higher education and of our redesign uh, in the future to see how we can break this iron triangle and what kind of methods, uh, but also what kind of technologies we can use to deliver high quality, uh, higher education to a large amount of learners. And of course, we also have, we are not operating in a completely free environment. Higher education institutions are also guided by accreditation indicators teacher quality, 
something like student staff ratio or contact hours, uh, which are stemming from a purely brick and mortar model. And the question is also if we need to adapt these to cater for um, a mixed or blended or hybrid model or a purely online model. Uh, because as we've seen in the pandemic, um, that all these dimensions uh, have suffered in some parts, uh, but at the same time, it was uh, it is not uh, the result that all, only low quality teaching has happened in this emergency remote teaching uh, situation. So um, we did some research on uh, educational scalability as a model, um, and we developed this education scalability model, which has four main components. And I think these components can be also guidelines to think differently about hybrid and blended learning in the future. And I would like to spend some time on these components, which are complexity, interaction, from the feedback, and the overall and well-known concept of constructive alignment in um, educational formats. So first of all, um, and we've chosen here a model by Miller, which is um, which is very easy to understand. You could also come here with Bloom or Anderson and Crabwell. Of course, there are different complexity levels in an educational format. Uh, at the lowest level, it's about factual knowledge transfer. Um, it's about uh, multiple choice questions, short answers. It's really a transfer oriented way of teaching. Uh, while um, a level higher, um, you have already some more performance related aspects uh, and the complexity of the educational offer increases in this pyramid. Like I said, this is just an example of uh, how to think about different quality at complexity levels in, in higher education. And the interesting bit here is, of course, that the scaling aspect relates uh, very deeply to these, um, this kind of thinking about different complexity levels. Because uh, as we know from, for example, the, the first MOOC of Sebastian Trun on uh, artificial intelligence, this is scaled quite well with 185,000 learners enrolled. On the other hand, it was mostly on the lowest level of this pyramid. So if we are operating there, scaling transfer of, of factual, no, factual knowledge, this is, this is easy to do. And this is also interesting at the current discussion, because I see already students saying, I don't miss the lectures. Let's keep them online. Let's, let's keep these lectures in an online format, uh, record them. Uh, there is no need to replace that again by the brick and mortar experience. The second component uh, of this scalability model, and we're talking here in this event about interaction, is that a deep and meaningful learning happens if we integrate three different perspectives on, on, on interaction. This is interaction between student, teachers, and the learning content. Um, and um, these, um, this figure here is from, from Terry Anderson, distance education scholar. Um, it has also a self-referential interaction. So students can interact with other students, uh, teachers can interact with, with teachers, and content can also interact with content. So if we model in our design these interactions, uh, we can be sure that there will be deep and meaningful learning happening. And then a third component of our scalability uh, model is uh, formative feedback. So uh, in what way is formative feedback, uh, feedback for learning possible? In which way is it implemented? Uh, and is it available to learners to ensure that the learning process of the learners can go on? And last but not least, uh, the well-known uh, constructive alignment model um, which is in general a useful idea. Um, for example, construct constructive alignment means that the learning outcomes, the assessment and the teaching method, that they are aligned. I give you an example of a mis misalignment. Uh, you often see educational formats which promise to focus on effective learning outcomes. So not in cognitive, but on effective uh, learning outcomes like 
changing attitudes, uh, becoming empathic or something like that. If you look then at the assessment, in the assessment, it's only about knowledge testing. And this, that would be an example of a misalignment. If you promise um, effective learning outcomes, you also have to ensure that you test for effective learning outcomes, which is, of course, very hard to do in a short time frame. Uh, this was now an example of, 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 of MOOCs again, but I think we also still see in higher education in general a misalignment also of learning outcomes and assessment practices. And this can also inform us in the decision what we will do in the future in a brick and mortar present situation and what we can do in an online context. Last but not least, these, um, all these ideas have a, a model behind it that we cannot scale up by increasing the teacher bandwidth. So uh, we need to be very careful that we uh, find methods to design hybrid and blended learning environments, uh, which do not increase the workload of the teaching personnel. This is, would be not a scalable way of thinking ahead, but we have to identify methods and also technologies which help us to increase the amount of learners without increasing the workload. Um, and there is an interesting interaction equivalency theorem, which is also well researched, uh, which gives us some opportunity to think about uh, these methods and approaches which do not increase the scalability. Again, from Terry Anderson, um, in which in this theorem, uh, they propose that if you uh, develop and design uh, um, one of these interaction components on a very high level, this can cater for the other two dimensions. Maybe not fully, but if that was exactly the model that traditionally higher uh, open universities were doing, because they were focusing on high quality learning content in which support was pretty much embedded. And by that, they could minimize the teacher-learner interaction. So that was the model that many open universities are, are following. And uh, I don't think it can be completely neglected uh, that there are also interaction, other interaction formats, but focusing uh, on one of these components and developing that on a very high level can help us to design scalable educational formats. And uh, the idea is that we can open this iron triangle by supporting the interaction of students and students, of students and content and students and teachers, and developing one of these interaction components uh, with a very high quality. And we did try to find some best practices, practices of, um, in, again, a sample of 50 massive open online courses. Uh, and we found some good practices of education, scalable use of digital technologies uh, and methods. Uh, these were, for example, automated elaborated feedback and multiple choice questions. This would be more low level. Video-based hints on request, um, adding support material to multiple choice with feedback, um, reference to other course material and videos and type of, of a feed forward feedback. Uh, and uh, of course, peer feedback, and it has been also, also mentioned already in the chat, peer feedback as a very, very powerful, but also complicated method to implement as a way to minimize workload of teaching personnel and to use the expertise uh, of learners to give themselves feedback. And last but not least, we identified guided discussions with prompts and guidelines or answering and commenting as another good practice to design scalable educational formats. There are, of course, besides uh, these more instructional methods, um, also others like worked out examples, uh, self-assessment is also uh, another method, but there are also more and more uh, digital technologies which can help us to um, scale up education, higher education, these are bots and virtual tutors, uh, matchmaking algorithms in which questions are, uh, are shared by peers, or recommender systems or prediction algorithms. So these technologies can help us to develop high quality 
large-scale educational formats. And um, I mentioned that presence is precious in the beginning of my talk. Uh, don't misunderstand me. Presence does not mean only presence in a brick and mortar context. We also have a model or experiences how to be present in a digital environment on a very high level. The only problem is that in the current shift to online learning, uh, we had people who didn't have a lot of experience with teaching online. So they went mostly into what they were able to do. Of course, they did this emergency remote teaching based on their current skills and competences. But we also have options to develop something. This is the community of inquiry model in which they say that teaching online is an intersection of three types of presence. It's the social presence, it's the cognitive presence, and it's the teaching presence. And the intersections on the intersections of these three dimensions, it's about supporting discourse, setting climate, and selecting content. I'm mentioning this because the decision what we do on a, in the brick and mortar situation or online also depends, of course, on the ability of the teaching personnel to create these learning opportunities online. And this sounds like an easy model to do, but it's mega complex to implement this, especially uh, with um, teachers who don't have so much experience um, in teaching online. And I hope that this will be a road ahead also for professional development, um, that these three dimensions of high quality online teaching will be taken into account. Um, as a general rule, I think um, we have huge opportunities to redesign higher education um, and to think based on uh, complexity and interaction about how brick and mortar interaction and online interaction is recipro reciprocal related. So it's not only about the components, but it's also about how these components relate to each other. And that will be a huge challenge, but also an opportunity uh, for future models of blended and hybrid learning and higher education. And I think, and I'm closing with that, I think I'm pretty much on time. Uh, the core questions for post-pandemic teaching models, which roles does pressions brick and mortar presence time will play in future teaching and learning practices in higher education. And I hope that these decisions will be guided by complexity and not by um, opportunity rather. So deciding based on, on quality of interaction and the complexity about when we spend time with learners on location and what we do online. And I think the, the Second overarching question is how we can use and employ digital technologies intelligently in the mix to increase interaction quality, but also to improve the scalability of teaching and learning and higher education. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't find the right uh, button to press on, and the chat was hiding my mic. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had to say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I really like your, your last two questions, um, um, and and the concept of of of, of presence, uh, of precious presence, uh, is is I think, uh, and and the combination of, of scalability is uh, is uh, two elements that are are. are really interesting to follow up and i want to follow up uh, if you allow me marco directly um because there was a question in the chat and i would like to uh, invite the, the the participants to use the chat uh, send your remarks and your questions in the chat if you can and you can send them to all participants and not necessarily to all uh, uh panelists thank you very much for those who've done uh, who sent the questions and remarks uh, now uh, to the panelists, and that was really supportive for attention during the session. But at this moment, we can uh, uh, make it more uh, visible to all uh, participants. Uh, Marco, uh, about scalability, there's a question. 
Maybe yeah, yeah, you, you, you referred already to it during your yeah. session. You're, you're more specialized in formal, uh, um, formative uh, assessment. But the question was about, uh, well, more uh, summative assessment uh, and, and, and scalability. What about uh, large groups of students? And there was also a link between or a question about the, the robustness of, of, of uh, and validity of, of uh, uh, digital assessments, uh, also referring to um, uh, cheating and uh, plagiarism. Do, do you have an idea about, about scalability and, and a more summative assessment? And, and, uh... So I think I'm, I can answer the comment by Kevin Hughes, who uh, asked yes. about peer marking. Um, so I think that peer activities are in general an underemployed uh, method in higher education, which we are not used to on a high level, which we are not using too much. On the other hand, I have to say the implementation is also a, a very complex one because um, it's not not done with just giving students tasks uh, in the feedback process. Uh, the success of peer feedback, and I would also say that this also relates to peer marking, uh, depends pretty much on how these learners are prepared, their attitude and prior experiences with giving peer feedback. Uh, but also um, the quality of the, of the feedback they are giving. The, the difference between high stakes and low stakes or formative and summative assessment would be that if you use peer marking for summative purposes, you have a much more, um, you have to take much more care for the quality of the peer marks which are giving, given. So I would say you would you would need to train the peer markers before that, which again might not be too scalable to do because you add again activities. And the other thing is uh, you need to be sure that the quality is so high that it's also accepted by your students. Otherwise, in a summative context, and which is the much more difficult one, uh, the learners might not accept it and only accept feedback and grades from a tutor or an expert. So that's the difficulty with um, high stakes, low stakes, uh, summative and formative. I think in the formative assessment, uh, it's much easier to implement that. Have you seen good examples of summative assessments that are really scalable? Um, and on higher, I mean, you mentioned the different levels. In the, the scale, it's easier to scale up if uh, if you if you are going on low levels of knowledge. Yeah. Uh, but it's, so, so in the MOOC study, we identified, uh, for example, uh, what we call the proxy feedback. Um, this means a lecturer um, is taking assignments from a selected number of students and discusses these ones in a video recording. That means he spends time on a limited amount, but on representative uh, assignments. And uh, by this method, learners can themselves compare their assignment with the assignment that has been discussed. So I think this is one of the methods which is more teacher driven, which at least has some level of scalability. Mm. Uh, but of course, it also on the learner side, you need to be competent to again, uh, assess yourself also compared to uh, what is discussed there. For the rest, of course, I mean, on the lower levels, you have these uh, methods uh, with multiple choice and more advanced feedback there. Um, that's that's the method. And for the rest, we really found a lot of peer uh, feedback practices and MOOCs, which work quite well. Okay, thank you very much, Marco. Carlos, there were some questions um, uh, posed to you. If you if you want to go into the question about assessment, you can as well. But there are also questions um, about well, impact on 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 blended learning, on the integrity of university, and 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 do we need to develop towards uh, larger units of of of, un of universities, um, and and also a question about copyright. Are you uh, can you can you take up one of those questions? You can make your own choice if you want. Okay, I see. One of the questions was uh, is that when when all of us will be applying the tools and methods described for me, there will be will be from technology point of view no difference for a student which university to register. <clears throat> I would say that the being at one university or another 
does not depend only on, on the tools used or, or the contents. I mean, last century, all universities used the blackboard and the chalk, and this doesn't mean that it's always the same. It, it's, it's rather defined by the experience. The experience much more than the content, much more than the tools. It, it, for instance, it's the selection of, of, of topics. It's the experience of the professor uh, in, in, in understanding a field and transferring it. It's the experience with other students. It's all the extracurricular activities. So I think the, the, the being at one year at the university is not about the tools. It's not about the content. It's, it's, it's much richer. It's, it's, it's about the experience. It includes many other things. No? Uh, on the other hand, I, I, I believe that um, the initiative for European universities is a very good one and that we should all universities also learn from one another and, 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 and get the best practices from others so that we all learn and all improve and all uh, advance in these difficult times where we have to redefine the many things of the university. So uh, I think this is also a learning experience for the university leadership. You know? So here again, I think uh, learning about best practices and, and how to struggle to redefine the, the whole structure of the university, you know? uh, I think is, is, is very relevant. In, in relation to, to the other question, I think there were two more questions. One is about um, assessment and, 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 and plagiarism, etc. I, I believe that lecturing and then taking finding exams is not the way for the future. Uh, I've expressed it in my presentation that I think active learning and the participation of the student throughout the whole year is the way to go and there might be different versions about it. Last year when I, I was teaching a master course which was, uh, I mean, it was not a huge number of students but the students had to develop a conversational agent uh, and there were some presentations by, by me at the very beginning but then it was work by the students facilitated and helped by professors and and when the pandemic came it didn't matter we, we still continue they continue working we continue helping them and at the end they made the presentation online so i think this is the way forward this is also the way uh, forward to uh, towards what the work uh, place needs not just uh, one way um, transmission of content and then examining and, and where the there can be a lot of plagiarism etc um there was another question uh, was, was a question about uh, and it's, it's something i recognize about uh, the dual delivery that uh, that that's come up now about um, in in the trans in the in the period that we're going now from 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 lockdown to more uh, yeah, 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 capitalities yeah. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. students being in the in in, in on campus in in in, in the uh, class session and again at the same time students um, remotely following and, and trying to to have the communication between those two groups of course uh, we have uh, yeah uh, yeah it said the students didn't want to uh, turn the camera on and, and just right. interacting with chat. I think this is also a learning path for everybody for for university leadership for professors for students no we would not allow a student to come into class completely hidden with with a sack on, on the head no why do we allow this there? So, but, but do we need to enforce it? Uh, or and, and if we enforce it, what are the penalties for nothing? So, I mean, this is all a learning experience, and we have to find the the right ways. Uh, if we, as we I saw the engagement, if the students, for instance, I, I saw this in in another uh, um, lecture, uh, another class. I uh, hold when I was lecturing, many students were. Uh, had the camera on, but then I used Wonder, this this interactive uh, video where they put in groups. No, there the students turned the camera on. The same students because they were talking to some other colleagues. So, uh, so th this is very interesting, and we have to to learn also uh, how we can handle that uh, as university organizations and as professors and teachers. I think we have, all have to to learn. Thank Martin. you, Marco. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just also wanted to comment on this um, hybrid delivery at the same time, which is a very challenging um, teaching mode. Uh, I, I also saw already during the pandemic some good examples in schools, for example, which had the equipment available like a smart board, a camera, so they streamed the content 
uh, also into the internet and there were some there was some interaction possible but again we are on a low complexity level for transfer of knowledge that wouldn't be a problem but of course if you come into interaction and group discussion and so on i think the scenario gets easily so complex that it's not hand you cannot handle it really um, with the current setting of higher education teaching rooms technologies uh, everything so i think we 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 are trying now stuff which we need to do and it's a learning experience like carlos said but at the same time we are of course facing the limits of how we thought about education before the pandemic Afonso, can you say something about that from the, the work perspective on, 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 on the, that kind of combination of work, being present, being not present, uh, and, and how, how people uh, uh, use their social presence, I'd love to say. And, and, and. Yes, I think that is very interesting too at the workplace uh, environment because there are several experiences that all of these are related with the the nature of the activity. And I think that Marco was talking about this and even Carlos, the nature of the activity is very mm -hmm. relevant. If you are preparing something in order to give and offer feedback, for instance, maybe you are creating this kind of space, safety space in order to put the camera on because feedback is important to do this. And in, in, in the workplace, there are several, you know, quick experiments trying to, to create several kinds of meetings. The meetings are not anymore these kind of meetings with one person sharing some ideas and, and presenting the results. No, no, the meetings are very different. There are meetings for feedback, for co-creation, for brainstorming, and each activity supposes a different level of presence, as Marco said. And I think that it's very interesting to think that the activity that you suggest in the virtual environment not only uh, determine or, or make conditions for the, the, the interaction, make a framework for this interaction, absolutely. Create a framework in order to promote people for sharing ideas, to making questions, to challenging another ideas. Then I think that in the workplace, we are using this kind of meeting more as a learning opportunity for sharing, for co-creating, for co-designing more than for sharing information. I think that in the past, mm -hmm. one year ago, the meetings at the work uh, working environment uh, were being a, a problem, less productive, very bureaucratic, a long, long uh, time consuming uh, meetings. But right now we are working a lot in sure meetings creating some kind of guidelines in order to prepare the, the, the way in which we will use it for, for, for learning opportunities for co-creation. And I think that this is a good idea. Maybe this will be a challenge, as Carlos said, for, for, the, for the university model, no? how we are creating this kind of, of lectures. Should be one hour, two hours of lecture, or should be one one hour but different moments with different presence with different activity with different purposes and maybe just the preliminary or the first 15 20 minutes the camera turn on is very important and if the students create this sense no this this kind of sense about being present no sharing the, the video maybe it could be important but the last part of the activity could be not necessary i think that it's a big challenge for sure. And I think that again, let me say it again. I think that what we are doing at the, the, the workplace learning opportunities could be a great uh, source of ideas of how to, to promote different levels of interaction using technology at the university level. Thank you very much. We're at the end of our webinar. Corrado, I would like to give you the the possibility to say some closing remarks. Firstly, I would like to thank, of, of course, all the presenters and all the participants um, and uh, hope to see you soon later. Corrado, just a few words to finish the whole session. Thank you. Well, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot to uh, all of you. I hope you enjoy this session together and uh, uh, I hope you have uh, 
you, you got uh, some good ideas from our projects and from uh, all the comments uh, on the expert. Um, as you have seen, we are in a learning mode, uh, our own, and we will um, get in touch and inform you on the progress of our projects. And if you are interested in uh, knowing more and interacting more with us, uh, please do not, uh, the, the interaction uh, doesn't not end with this workshop, but just write us and we will uh, get you engaged. Uh, thank you very much, Luke, for this fantastic organization, and thank you, thanks a lot to the uh, old uh, team that uh, work uh, behind the scenes, um, Scarlett, Liz, Lot, uh, Yoke, uh, to uh, make this uh, possible. Thanks a lot. Yes, certainly. Thank you, the team of Teach for for supporting us technically. See you all soon. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marco. Oh, Thank you, Carlos. Bye. I really enjoyed your presentation. Bye bye. Me too. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.